Hello. I know it was a very quick break. I know it was very quick for people to leave and come back. We apologize. We're here. We're now. We're starting. So this session is the future of digital governance. One of the wonderful things about the future is we really don't know what it's going to be like. So it's a good place to start. Um, so we've seen this week, we've seen in write-ups, we've seen all kinds of suggestions and ideas for new mechanisms, GDCs, new kinds of digital fora, new kinds of mechanisms and such. And it prompted some of us to sort of start asking the question, well, what's wrong with the IGF? And part of that question came out, well, there are lots of gaps. And in fact, if you read each one of these testaments that people are putting out about the best idea for the future, there's, there's a gap. And there's a, a saying that, well, this gap needs to be filled. It's important. There are other importance. The IGF, you've been around for 18 years and you've got these gaps. So one of the things that we started looking at, one of the things I started looking at was, well, we've been around for 18 years. We're about to go into that renewal season. And when you go into the renewal season, you look at, well, what do you need to do for the future? The future that we're here to talk about, about digital governance or internet governance or whatever we call a future governance. Um, and we started to look at, well, if something that was started a while back that was started with great intentions, with great promise, has done good things, is well formed, took a lot of work, took a lot of money, took a lot of time. And when we talk about starting a new forum, believe me, there's a lot of work to do. I've been watching the IGF since it was first conceived of in the Working Group on Internet Governance and nursed through the original, had, had the honor of being on the Secretariat, had the honor of being on the MAG, had the honor of being a voice in the wilderness. I've done all of those roles quite happily. So one of the questions that we started to look at was, well, what are the gaps? What are really the gaps? And, and, and how is it that the IGF could conceivably fulfill them? Could conceivably fulfill them without having to cur incur all the expense and bandwidth and pain and suffering of trying to start something new? So we've got, we've got a certain number of pre-existing questions, but we also yesterday, while talking to the panelists, sort of said, thinking about Tunis agenda, thinking about uh, what remains to be done, thinking about the gaps. How could we solve those gaps? Could we? And if somebody wants to say the IGF couldn't possibly fill that gap, why not? So basically that's sort of the, the shape of what we're, we're having a conversation here both amongst ourselves and hopefully with you all to sort of try and explore that gap space and see what it would really take to solve the problems of that gap. So with that, I pass it on to my co-moderator, Anna Nevis, and please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Avery. Uh, hello, speakers. Uh, hello to all. Avery, don't you think that Everyone must, maybe they are a bit confused about all these movements that we, we have nowadays at global level on digital. A little confused. A little confused. And I think that after this, uh, so it's the fourth day of the IGF, including the zero day, of course. And um, I think that uh, with the people that I've been talking to, it was interesting to see that people are becoming some more confused, uh, some more thinking in, uh, in, uh, in different things that they were thinking before they, are, that they came here. But uh, the thing is that uh, uh, topics re related uh, to digital are nowadays front and center on the international uh, agenda. So, uh, and uh, nowadays we are talking a lot about uh, uh, artificial uh, intelligence. So, during this IGF, there was a lot of sessions about uh, uh, 
uh, artificial uh, intelligence. But my point here is that um, the fast evolution of technology, new approaches and, and the developments such as the, the metaverse and all that include emerging technologies as well uh, uh, as the web 3.0, decentralization, need for uh, ubiquitous connectivity, higher speeds, low latency, and high quality connectivity requirements uh, may contribute to widening the digital gaps among regions, countries, on, and on a local level. So this will cause a major difference in devolution and development in economy, social, political, and education, educational areas as well as uh, uh, reduce the possibility for certain regions of the world to effectively participate in digital internet governance processes. I just would like to remember, uh, and then I will give the floor, of course, to our uh, speakers, but, uh, uh, well, uh, I and Avery, we, we are here trying to make the context and to give you the context. And I just would like to remember uh, that uh, the goal of WESIS, the World Summit on Information Society that gathered heads of state in 2003 and then in 2005, the ministers responsible for the Information Society. Uh, so the goal of WESIS was, is to achieve a common vision, desire, and commitment to build a people-centric, inclusive, and development-oriented information society where everyone can create, access, utilize, and share information. The Geneva Action Plan, agreed at the first Twizy Summit in 2003, identified 18 areas of activity in which government, civil society, uh, businesses, and uh, international organizations uh, should work together and are working together. Uh, to uh, achieve the potential of ICTs for development. The Tunis Agenda for the Information Society was a consensus statement of the WISIS, adopted on the 18th of November 2005 in Tunis. It called for the creation of the IGF uh, and a novel, lightweight, multi-stakeholder governance structure for the internet which includes, since then, the public and private sectors, the technical and academic communities, and civil society. And uh, nowadays, we have all these processes, including the WISIS Plus 20, um, which includes the summit of the future that will include the digital through the digital compact. And uh, we have uh, other processes at worldwide level. So what will be the future, as Ari uh, was uh, saying? And why IGF is not good enough? Or is it good enough? Or which are the gaps, as Ari uh, very well said? So let's go to hear our speakers. And I will give the floor first place to Jordan Carter, Internet Governance and Policy Director at uh, uh, .au, Domain Administration, Australia. Jordan, please. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, great to be on this panel today, joining an interesting group of speakers. Um, I'm just making some personal remarks here, having, having thought about this stuff for a, a long time. I'm going to try and stick to making three main points. Um, and the starting point, of course, is the centrality of the internet to our day-to-day -day lives. If anyone thought that wasn't the case uh, until 2020, they got a brutal reminder of that in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and whether it's the internet itself or the, the services and applications that we rely on that run on top of it, uh, this digital realm, this internet realm, is central to our lives, which is why it is so important. So important that uh, the Secretary General identified it as one of the two major challenges facing the planet along with the climate crisis. So I want to make three main points to you today because if we get this right, we can support the human flourishing that we should have as our vision for this planet. We can have uh, just, peaceful, and prosperous societies, sustainable economies all around the world. So there's a lot to play for here. And my first point is a, is a simple one that relates to the slightly provocative title of this panel, 
We cannot separate internet governance and digital governance. They're intertwined, and they are intertwined because almost all digital technology relies on communication, and the communication network that we all rely on is the internet. It is true that where digital policy issues stray too far away from an internet aspect, they may need their own institutions and discussions. And me being me, I would say that if they are having their own spaces, they should definitely apply the multi-stakeholder approach to having those conversations. But most of the time, the digital and internet realms are intertwined and they should stay that way. Um, because otherwise, we will see a bifurcation of these policy dialogues, increasing complexity, uh, and more and more resources being spent in forums that are very close to duplicating each other. My second point uh, is to say that effective internet governance needs to be multi-stakeholder internet governance. I've already talked about the centrality of the internet to our lives, to the information societies that we are building. And that is why the IGF is such an important forum. Its structure and its scope forces the collision of the broad concerns and interests and perspectives from around the world and around the different stakeholder communities. Uh, and it does that by making sure there's a seat at the table and space in the room for all the stakeholder groups, for civil society, for the technical community, academia, businesses in the private sector, and of course, for governments. Without this blend, we could end up just having an interesting technology discussion or an interesting policy discussion, but that is not what we need. What we need is internet governance. And nothing could be worse than building a duplicate structure for digital governance issues alongside it. We have the forum already. We're all right here in it today. But actually, something could be worse uh, than that. It would be moving it into a single stakeholder-dominated forum around which there are some proposals floating around, a government-preferenced forum. That would be worse than duplication, and it's something I urge us all to oppose. My third point is to talk a bit about the gaps that the moderators uh, mentioned before, because I don't want to pretend that the internet governance system we have today is perfect. Uh, put your hands up if you think it is perfect. Yeah, there are no hands up in the room, and I'm not going to ask about the Zoom room. Um, the world has changed a lot since the settlement of the early 2000s, and it's sad to say that it is not always for the better the ways that it has changed. And so we need to strengthen the IGF and address some gaps. And I just want to propose three for your consideration. Hopefully they're a little bit provocative and help you start thinking about these and getting ready to engage with the panel from the floor. I think there's an ambition gap, a coordination gap, and a resource gap. And just to be, speak briefly, on the ambition side, I don't have the future vision that the internet needs, but I know that if we want to get the internet that we want, we need to take the daring step of describing it and describing the goals that will get us there. What is our ambition for the information society? How will we measure our progress? How will we support the sustainable development goals support human flourishing. What is the internet we want and how do we build it? So to close that gap, let's develop and agree goals to do that. That could focus the work of our internet governance system. Uh, and it could be a way to develop or create a need to develop new working methods here in the IGF to be able to discuss and agree such things. Not to replace the SDGs, not to create a rod for our back, but to focus our efforts. The second is the coordination gap. We have a distributed model of internet governance with different institutions and different communities all doing part of the job. For that to work, it needs incredibly strong coordination. And the IGF can be the forum to do that coordination, but once again, there are some working methods to do it. Um, in our own technical community, We've been articulating a need for stronger coordination. I think it applies more broadly as well. And briefly, the third gap is the resources gap. If you think about the incredible work our IGF secretariat does with five people, five people, and then you think about the scale of the overall governance systems in individual countries, let alone uh, the global level, you can see that none of us together as stakeholders are putting enough resources into this forum. 
And we're also not resourcing well enough the diverse participation that we need, both to make the outcomes of the IGF more useful and to make uh, its legitimacy stronger. So the resources gap is one that needs to be closed. So to recap, uh, in closing, we should not separate digital governance and internet governance. We must maintain a multi-stakeholder approach and model in doing it. All key stakeholder groups are required, and nothing could be worse than removing digital issues to an intergovernmental forum. And we must close gaps to strengthen the IGF and deliver the internet we want. The ambition gap, the coordination gap, and the resources gap. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jordan. Uh, thank you for your initial remarks, and then I will give the floor uh, to Renata Mieli, coordinator of the Brazilian Internet S Steering Committee, for her uh, first uh, comments and remarks, please. Thanks, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to greet my fellow participants, my fellow session participants, and thank the IGF for inviting me to be part of this panel, which encourages us to come together in a main session to address the various concerns and discussions we have followed to go this event about our future as a governance community. I will bring to this discussion some reflections that stem from the experience of the Internet Steering Committee in Brazil, a multi-stakeholder governance group that has been built with dedication over its 28 years. The first point of this reflection is to look at the journey we have taken up to this point. Today's internet is very different from what it was 20 years ago when, he, when the first round of WISIS took place. It has expanded globally, irreversible, penetrating people's lives. It has grown technically stronger, becoming more resilient and faster than we ever imagined. It has become a critical infrastructure for economic, social, and cultural development. The layer of applications and content which gives the internet concrete meaning in people's lives has also developed. With this expansion, our governance community has also grown. National and regional initiatives now form a global network across different countries, and regions, youth, and dams. As an example, I mentioned the recent hosting of the first Lusophone Internet Governance Forum in Brazil less than a month ago. These spaces have become more diverse, diverse and inclusive. The diversity of sectors and actors at this IGF which brings together around 8,000 people in person and online is evidence of its growth. These expansions of the internet and its applications has also brought emerging challenges to be addressed. Increased economic concentration in the ecosystem, an infodemic of misinformation, the use of the internet to attack democracy processes, an increase in violence and hate speech, the environmental impacts of our infrastructure, children's and adolescents' vulnerability on the internet, and all the possibilities and risks that arise with the evolution of artificial intelligence, another topic that has catalyzed the discussions on this edition. Therefore, to discuss our future, we cannot ignore this trajectory and the current challenges, especially in light to the, to the dilemma that the internet governance community faces. We have been discussing and participating in various different arenas, and the complexity slows no signs of decreasing. The WISIS Plus 20 and the Global Digital Compact are only two among all the processes being undertaken within the ecosystem, with much of them potentially overlapping in several streams. Concerns about the future have been growing and demand more transparency, support, and meaningful participations in discussions and decisions. In this context, multiple stakeholders are calling for avoiding the fragmentation of internet governance arenas, splitting discussions about the internet from those covering digital issues. Those topics are inseparable pair, like two sides of the same coin. Their challenges are intertwined, as Jordan said. Decisions about one impact the other. We all need to revisit the Tunis agenda, which remains extremely relevant in their essence and already addresses these integrated issues. Many of the goals established there 
are yet to be achieved, and the guiding principles are still fully valid. Our role as members as as members of the Internet Governance Community, is to review our own mechanisms and, institu and institutions based on the principle promoted by the Tunis Agenda. Our current concern can be summarized in two major points. Avoid the fragmentation of the debate and the creation of competing governance spaces that could weaken multi-stakeholder participation, as we have unfortunately seen in the GDC construction process, which has resulted in uncertainty about its outcome. How to improve the IGF's model of debate and participation so that it can address the challenges at hand, generate discussions that contributed to promoting insights for decision making by various global stakeholders. To achieve this, we must fully embrace diversity to improve effective multi-stakeholder participation, which is essential for the future, future of the internet cultural, linguistic, gender diversity, and as many other forms of diversity are critical to driving our governance community. This is the path we have been pursuing in Brazil. The multi-stakeholder model is challenging because it brings together this diversity, gathering different perspectives, and we don't always agree. But when we bring our, when we bring our difference to the table, rather than ignore them, we all grow. Let's take this opportunity to reflect on the achievements that the internet governance community has already made and how we can contribute to charging, to charging the paths to address the inequalities that feel exclusion. Effective multi-stakeholder participation is crucial for any proposed solution to our internet-related issues, including the so-called digital ones. And in our perspective, the IGF was, is, and must be the definitive place of this, for these discussions to take place in order to provide inputs that enable effective, effective outcomes and other forums around the world. Thank you for the opportunity, and we continue later. Uh, muito obrigada, Renata. Thank you very much, Renata. And now I will give the floor to Liz Fu, member of the IGF leadership panel. Liz, please. Thank you, Anna, and um, good afternoon. And uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak on, on this uh, panel. We uh, speak about many, many topics here at the IGF. We speak about security, innovation, skills, connectivity, sustainability. But exactly this uh, topic that we're discussing here uh, comes first at a very important time and it asks a very important question because it's the overall question of what is the future of uh, Internet Governance Forum. And, um, and Internet Governance as, as such. But um, why is this uh, timing important? Well, we've heard it both from uh, our uh, moderators and, and also the two panelists. We have the WISIS Plus 20 coming up. But we also have a number of other uh, policy initiatives uh, underway in the UN, uh, such as the Global Digital Compact, which will be a part of a wide-ranging summit for the future, driven by Secretary General uh, Guterres. And we also see that there is now a tech envoy uh, in the uh, UN following developments in technology, but also governance. He's also an ex officio member of the leadership panel. And here today I speak as a member of the leadership panel. In my daily life, I am a director general of Etno, which is a telecom trade association in, in Brussels. But uh, be mindful, I speak as a leadership panel now. Um, so if we look at uh, IGF itself, we see there have been some innovations uh, in the past year or two. So the UN Secretary General established uh, uh, and gave a mandate to the leadership panel. And you've heard from us last year and throughout this week. And as a leadership panel, we will also uh, be serving until uh, the next uh, IGF. 
This is a panel of experts uh, chaired by Vint Cerf, and we bring together the technical community, academia, civil society, private sector, and governments. And we have been working in our respective constituencies to raise the awareness of IGF and also amplify the messages of IGF. And one of the most important uh, uh, aspects of the leadership panel lately, but uh, it will develop in the, in the coming years, has been to set a framework of the internet we want. And we see this as forming a basis for a series of goals or objectives to support the development of an open, secure, right-respecting internet across the globe. We have set a framework, and that's not meant to, that we will have a top-down process on this. We are now hoping that these principles will be uh, unfolded by and supported and uh, set, the goals will be set by the global community. So we will consult broadly, not only as we used to call the internet, the international internet community, to me, we need to consult with the global community because everyone uses the internet these days. We, have, as a leadership panel, we have also contributed to the work on the Global Digital Compact by sharing uh, with the co-facilitators the messages that we have seen and agreed with all of you. And, uh, is vitally important internet governance community. So you gave us input both in Addis Abeba, but also in 2021 in Katowice. So we as a leadership panel didn't take our own position on this, but we tried to uh, condense the input from the last two IGFs and conveyed it uh, to the Global Digital Compact Consultation. So, uh, if we look at the gaps, we have talked about the gaps, and uh, we see there is a lot of uh, activity on many fronts, but uh, I want to look at what aspects of internet governance need to be strengthened, because we as a leadership panel see it as we need to strengthen the IGF, because we see IGF as a part of internet governance future. So for us, uh, key uh, is the uh, representation and participation. We have seen a huge number of participants as this very IGF in Japan, more than 8,000. I heard numbers of 9,000 across the globe has signed up and, and followed both uh, online and in person. But the UN reminds us that 2.6 billion people are still offline and we are actually far from reaching the SDGs and from harnessing the benefits of digital, which should get us there, uh, and we think this is a virtual circle. And at the same time, we also have to acknowledge that digital and internet governance is no longer the sole remit of a small part of society and businesses. The uptake and impact of the internet is now a whole of society matter. So to me, the biggest gap is, and, and this is what should drive our work as a community, is we need a greater and more diverse participation at IGF. We should not be an echo chamber talking to each other of like-minded uh, communities. And what does that mean? That means greater industry participation, and not just tech and telecom companies. We need other sectors like banking, public administration, manufacturing, transportation, healthcare. All of them are using the internet and connectivity in new ways. And I don't mean only using, but these actors are actually employing high-skilled developers to create tailor-made uh, digital solutions. So we need to see these people at IGF. And it means also more uh, participation from legal professions. The internet is now fundamental to our lives and economies, 
and with new challenges from security to data protection to workers' rights, implication of new technologies on equality, safety in the workplace, access in education, taking out a bank loan, signing up for an insurance, the applications are endless. And with that comes the need for highly qualified legal professionals from solicitors to barristers to judges and magistrates to bring their expertise here, but also to learn from us who are sitting here right now. So we all need to interact and we need to see these people here at the IGF. And it means consistently and constantly increasing participation from the global south. This is the group which needs access to high quality connectivity, devices and skills. And they're absolutely, they must be here to shape the internet we want. And again, we need to see these people here at IGF. So how do we get there? Uh, this is my last part. Speaking as a member of the leadership panel, I, now, uh, I know we have a role at this and an immense challenge. But we need to make a clear value proposition to these groups that I talked about. And this means strong and impactful outreach and showcasing IGF as a place where you can be a part of the process of how we want the internet will to be tomorrow. We need to share with the peers and other sectors on the challenges and the opportunities of the internet and digital technology and reinforcing the multi-stakeholder model. So, a final word on the future of the internet governance. The internet we want can and should be an important component of the global digital compact. And I believe that the GDC should be anchored in the IGF. And the IGF is a well-established, well-respected mechanism to monitor and implement the decisions taken by the multi-stakeholder community for the future of the internet. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Liz, and thank you very much for putting um, uh, in, uh, in context all this internet governance and the digital technologies and importance to, uh, to reach all these different uh, stakeholders from the healthcare, insurance companies, banking, etc. Extremely important. So now I'm going to give the floor to uh, our last uh, speaker. No, sorry, not the last. Uh, before the last one, <laughs> Anita uh, Gurumusti, uh, Executive Director, IT for Change India. Please, Anita. Thank you so much. Um, I think that some of the points I will make may perhaps uh, take a note or two that are slightly different from my predecessors. Um, we, uh, in our networks and in our organization, believe that the crisis of digitality is entirely a crisis of its governance. So how do we reframe global digital governance and how do we ensure that the future of global digital governance takes into account a world besieged by extreme inequality? The GDC process initiated by the Secretary General precedes the 20th year review, as has already been mentioned, of the World Summit on the Information Society in 2025. The arrangements forged through the GDC must correspond to the momentous changes providing the normative directions and key themes to inform the WSIS Plus 20 review process. But where do we begin and what must we acknowledge? A productive and fruitful engagement with the GDC process requires recognition of a historical fault line, a democratic deficit that continues to mark the technical governance of the internet. Today's geopolitical tensions are also rooted in the stranglehold over the digital economy of a few large transnational corporations from mainly two countries. The distressing degeneration of the public sphere and the imponderables around the future of AI governance. 
With data and AI technologies decisively shaping value chains and market power in a pandemic-stricken world, public policy discussions on digital issues are also now part of the entire multilateral system, from digital trade to biodiversity, health, food, and oceans. So this is a story of contestation, complexity, and uncertainty. Where do we go from here? First, we do not want to be running in the same place as we invent the new institutions of tomorrow. The Secretary General's July 2023 policy brief conceptualizes two main institutional arrangements. A tripartite digital policy space, which is termed the Digital Cooperation Forum for the short term, and a global commission on just and sustainable digitalization for the long term. The Digital Cooperation Forum and its tripartite dialogic mode seems to bring back echoes of the IGF. Caution is needed so that it does not simply reproduce all the flaws of the IGF with due respect to the strengths of the IGF. We know that dialogue is important, but public policy is more than dialogue. It is based on tenets of public interest and democratic deliberation. It cannot be held hostage to tokenistic representation and diversity optics. The Global Commission for a Reinvented Multilateralism is a worthwhile idea, but both these bodies must, must derive their mandate from the VSIS Plus 20 process built consultatively and democratically with engagement from civil society. Sadly, the most powerful countries from the global north do not want new arrangements. Please read their submissions online to the GDC consultation process. Second, we need to move from a technical idea of data governance to humanize it, to evolve rights adequate to the epoch of homo technicus. That data must flow freely, albeit with trust, is a refrain that strips the real politic of data governance, reducing any contention with the cross-border flow of data to the singular issue of data privacy guarantees. What we need is a new articulation of rights that accounts for people's development sovereignty in the digital paradigm, a new narrative of data flows with rights, including the right to connectivity and data public goods, the right to be forgotten, the right to be represented or not in digital systems, data rights for algorithmic work environments, and so on. We need a people's data and AI constitutionalism at the international level, that is, an instrument that also legitimizes people's collective right to A, determine how aggregate data resources are utilized, and B, enjoy their rightful claims in the benefits of data-enabled intelligence. Without a bedrock of principles, the mechanisms to achieve coherence ac across the multilateral system cannot evolve. Third, without reining in the power of digital TNCs through mandatory obligations in all jurisdictions of their operation, Global digital governance cannot encourage innovation, economic pluralism, or environmental sustainability. It cannot respect people's rights. We are at an inflection point. The planet is not synthetic. We need ambition. Fourth, global digital governance calls for system-wide rebooting. We need a reform of international financial institutions and the international tax regime for public finance of digital infrastructure development. The conversation must shift to public digital innovation ecosystems that are nurtured globally so that private enterprise can thrive everywhere and people can be connected on their terms. To conclude, the present of digital governance is not in a good place. This assessment is based on a simple counterfactual. Had we evolved governance institutions and mechanisms that were adequate to our digital coexistence, the information society would have been more like the aspirational values of the Geneva Declaration. It would have, and I quote, fostered justice and the dignity and worth of the human person. It would have respected peace and upheld the fundamental values of freedom, equality, solidarity, tolerance, shared responsibility and respect for nature. All of this articulated in 2003. We are nowhere close. The, text, the test of successful digital cooperation would be in one core idea, the right to flourishing of people and the planet. This would mean public agora built on pluralism and inclusion, economies that thrive on, thrive on peering and reciprocity, 
and societies of unlimited creativity and self-actualization. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anita. Thank you very much. And now I'll give the floor to our last speaker at this round, uh, Timia uh, Suto. Um, she is Global Digital Policy Lead uh, at the uh, ICC. Thank you, Anna, um, and thank you, uh, panelists, and thanks for the audience for waiting until the last speaker. I promise we'll turn it over soon. Um, my name is Timo Schutte. I'm the Global Digital Policy Lead at the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, for those of you who don't know us, ICC um, is a, a global business organization um, encompassing members of over 45 million companies of all sectors and sizes um, all over the world. Uh, we are present in over 170 countries. Um, and also, for those of you who don't know us, um, ICC was um, the business focal point back uh, at WIS's time uh, almost 20 years ago. I haven't myself been there 20 years ago, but I was at WIS's plus 10, and I can't believe it's already been 10 years from then, so I can understand some of you who have been there as Avri since the beginning um, of, of how much uh, has changed since then. And I want to start there today taking a bit of stock of what, what has happened 20 years ago um, and, and where we are now. And what was this, uh, as my fellow panelists said, created um, was this vision for, for a people-centered information society um, and has created uh, also a forum where that vision can be furthered, which was is the IGF, um, as a non-decisional body to discuss public policy issues related to internet governance. But most importantly, what was has created was this concept of multi-stakeholderism, coined this concept of multi-stakeholderism. And as I said, I wasn't there, but I've heard from many of you how difficult it was to, to make that happen, uh, how um, the representatives of non-governmental organizations, civil society, tech, uh, tech companies, um, uh, the technical community, um, really banging on the doors of, of, uh, of the negotiating room to be let in and have their, have their voice. And what has happened since is, is I'm going to quote um, what is written in our common agenda in paragraph 93, um, where United Nations Secretary General says, United Nations governments, the private sector, and civil society could come together as a multi-stakeholder digital technology track in preparation for the summit of the future to agree on a global digital compact. Right? So it's no banging on the doors, no asking to be let in. It's an invitation to commonly come together and create something. So that is, I think, an achievement in it, on its own. Now, to uh, Jordan's point, uh, is the IGF uh, perfect? Is our, is our internet governance world perfect? Is multi-stakeholderism perfect? No, it's not. Nothing is. Um, there is room for improvement. There is room to to build on, on what we've achieved. There is room to make it stronger. We should be doing that. But I also think we also, also need to think about, as we think towards the gaps, so that I can get to the point of what I want to, what you've asked me to answer, we need to think about what the IGF is and what it isn't, what it was created for, um, and have we really used it effectively. So is IGF going to solve universal connectivity? No, it will not, but it will bring together, it does bring together telecommunications companies, tech companies, development banks, governments, to discuss what's going on and to make it happen. There are projects that were born here at the IGF that are now running over the world to do just that. Will it set technical standards? No, it will not, but it will bring together the technologists, the engineers, um, civil society organizations, human rights activists, to make sure that the standards that we set are the right ones for, for our digital future. Will it set norms for cybersecurity? No, it will not set norms for cybersecurity, but it brings together all the actors that can assess if those norms are properly implemented, um, and it can hold us accountable, all of us, if we're doing our part or not. Will it set policies on responsible, trustworthy AI? No, it will not. But it will bring together the policymakers that do that as those policies are set to hear from all of us whether or not we are going in the right direction. We've seen it happen two days ago. That is what the IGF is. It is a convener for all of us to come together and 
see have we come far enough from that vision that was set 20 years ago? What else is necessary to do? And are the right people in the room? As Lisa said, is everyone here? Now, yes, there are gaps. Not everybody is here. We don't have the necessary resources to always make these things happen as the way we should. And I think that creates an awareness gap that is very dangerous because that awareness gap makes others think that new things should be created, that it's not good enough. We need to also think about what we do achieve. Have we marketed it properly? Have we shared that properly to the, to the people that are not here? And have we made them aware in their own terms so that it resonates with their work, with their interest, that they should be here, that we need them here? But that means that we need to open up our own IGF community that we've created and go directly and speak to others that are not here to make them part of it. And that only is possible if we properly share what the outputs of this forum are, what they can be, and what the values are, what the success stories are. And I think we have a bit longer way to go um, to do that. So if I can leave you with that in terms of the gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming in with your, with, with your perspectives. I'd like to invite the, the, the rest of you, the other participants who are sitting in, 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 in those seats, to, to, to come up. We, we have, I guess, 38 minutes left on the timer of this, so I'd like to give as much time. Please come to the microphone, introduce yourself, and then comment either on what you heard or your own idea of what the gaps are and what needs to be done, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Carlos Vera. I am from Ecuador. And I uh, must agree with two main ideas from the panel. A human-centered discussion, and also, as Jordan said, let's maintain the multi-stakeholder model. This is essential. I've been around for 25 years in these panels. And maybe I see seven men in that panel. Now, there are six women, one man. It's working. Thank you. Thank you. Please, there are one, two, three, I count four microphones up there. There must be opinions, there must be comments. Otherwise, if you guys don't have the comments, do we have anybody with a comment who's in the uh, online and, and where is our online moderator to, to tell us? Yes, do we have any? No? Yes, we do. So can you please read? Oh, well, please come to the microphone if that's okay. We do have a few comments, though. Um... We have two hands up. I don't know if you want to bring them in, um, but they're on the... Zoom oh, sure. Now. If there are people that wish... Yeah, I, I don't have that showing on my... So, please. There's Ayalu um, with his hand up. His or hers hand up. They hand up. Oh, yeah. Please, are you unmuted and able to speak? Yes, please, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to put my uh, question and opinions. And I joined um, uh, IGF last year in Addis Ababa. Uh, my name is Ayala Shibeshi. I'm born in Ethiopia. I'm working uh, and studying in Australia. My research area is uh, fiat physical, um, uh, physical fiat currency or digital fiat currency and CDBC uh, with uh, accessibility and account. Um, uh, uh, traceability. So if anyone interested, um, uh, uh, let me know. Uh, my question, I have two questions and I have two, uh, three proposals. The first question is how the nature of the internet and internet technology be inclusive and fairness with practical application while the government shut down and misuse the internet services? That's one question. Two, is it possible to fully access technology via the internet as a digital public infrastructure 
uh, ecosystem while owned by the government or the nations of the country, which is without international internet governance law. So these are my questions. If you allow to me to elaborate, uh, I can um, uh, uh, propose my, um, read my proposal, or I have three proposals, uh, or um, uh, you can read it. It depends, it, it will take me another two, three minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, advanced technologies such as AI, blockchain, quantum computing, and IoT, EOT, NFC, and NFT, all these technologies generate huge amount of data or information. This data, uh, these days, data or information is a wealth. The wealth accumulated in developed nations. All these technologies perform activities and services via the, the internet. First, the, the need for United Nations internet governance law. Dear participant, let, me th let us think about the root cause of the uh, current internet connectivity, major problems such as by the name of freedom of speech and democracy, uh, universal human rights, and restricted demo um, unrestricted democracy and freedom of inclusive connectivity, etc., affected local government and uh, countries unable to control um, the internet and it distract the country and the country shut down the internet. There is no accountability and also there is no international law to stop them. Uh, second, we need to educate uh, the uh, cyber security because that's the internet. We must uh, start education cyber hackers to behave as a human nature, uh, a, a, a natural human being, behave professionally and ethically applying natural law or rather than uh, uh, natural law with more soft skill rather than uh, using the hard skill. And um, uh, we, uh, if we all perform any task with integrity, honesty, humanity, kindness, apply responsibility and accountability for equitable benefit of all, all human beings, uh, all humankind, uh, as a global society, including um, all nations and benefit of this earth. The last question, the last suggestion, um, the third uh, current existing uh, working system of the internet must be evaluated. We must break, we must br um, break the current cycle of the world society governing system which is dominated uh, everything uh, by developed nations, uh, even before the internet. We must build a new system that match suitable, applicable, and rapid technology, uh, advanced technology interest to all nations nationwide, fully agreed and signed by the United Nations Internet Governance Forum and the ITU, which is um, uh, uh, a member of all uh, international countries of telecommunication. Unless otherwise we don't have the standard regulations to accountable all each countries, we will not be rich and inclusiveness of the internet. I really appreciate it for giving me this time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it. Now we have one person at a microphone and we have another remote. So um, I think I'll go with the microphone and then I'll go to the next remote and then I'll come back to the microphone if that's okay. So please, sir, introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the rich discussion and the, the really hopeful proposals I think outlined today. My name is Peter Mysek. I'm general counsel at Access Now. I wanted to actually present the results of a, uh, an, a discussion earlier this week. A civil society met on day zero uh, in a session about scoping of the global digital compact. We had a, a diverse group inside and outside the room and were able to reach a rough consensus um, on uh, ways to uh, really strengthen the process of the global digital compact and ensure that it is representative and meets the kind of high and lofty goals that we've heard um, laid out. The, 
Um, three areas that we focused on, if I could present, uh, were around transparency and responsiveness, uh, synergies and coherency, uh, scope, and then a bit of background. So first on transparency uh, and responsiveness, uh, we all have uh, spent a lot of time already. Um, there's been a lot of opportunities to input into the Global Digital Compact, um, the deep dives led by uh, the Tech Envoy Office, uh, regional uh, co uh, collaborations and convenings, but we don't know how these inputs are being used. We don't know um, what the outputs will look like. Uh, we have um, only seen in the last couple of months a sh very short uh, paper from the co-facilitators of the process that uh, we think doesn't really reflect the rich discussions. And so um, getting uh, you know, more, more meaningful multi-stakeholder processes that are gender inclusive, that, in clear response, that include clear responsive feedback loops, um, and uh, the inclusion of uh, all stakeholders by design is really key. If there are to be multilateral discussions on the GDC, uh, we need to know the timelines ahead of time. Uh, if they're going to be in person, uh, applying for visas, uh, you know, to, to attend those, um, is uh, going to take time and uh, member states should take care to include civil society in their delegations. <coughs> On synergies and coherency, um, we really echo what you've said about rooting uh, the outcomes of the GDC in the IGF and um, we've, we are this week using the IGF itself to strengthen the Global Digital Compact. Um, and uh, we uh, reached rough consensus that the IGF is an open and inclusive forum and uh, ever more so every year, we hope, um, and should not be replaced or duplicated by another forum, especially one based in a global north city um, that, that carries environmental costs and, and um, very real costs to attend and participate in. Um, finally, on scope, uh, we want to redouble efforts to involve the technical community, um, acknowledging that tech internet governance is broader than technical discussions. We think those are key stakeholders that uh, really succeeded during the stress test of COVID um, when systems suddenly went online uh, and we all depended on the internet. Uh, for our basic uh, daily work, um, the horizontal technical government succeeded, and uh, we wish to kind of re-invoke and involve them uh, in these discussions. So that's where I'll leave it. Again, that's a rough consensus from civil society on Sunday. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, I just want to point out where we are. I have a Deborah Allen now who's, who's, who's on, online. Then I have two people at microphones and one to read. So I think I'm going to call that the cues for now, given the time. So please, Deborah. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. And thank you for, the, uh, for hearing me on this panel. I want to make a couple of real quick comments um, to amplify the work you're doing about what you all just said get the word out and participation. I mean, the fact that I'm, to introduce myself, I'm in The Hague, I'm from uh, New York City, but I have a nonprofit here in The Hague called Find Out Why. We promote digital fluency. We work with the European Internet Forum and um, Lisa, I saw you in DC this summer at the Transatlantic Partnership. So this is an example of civil society getting on the mic at the panel. And I just want to commend all of you and say that it's happening. It's doing, you're doing it, right? Because here I am, that's proof. That's number one. The second comment was get the word out. Because of the fact that you're in Kyoto, I'm wondering if anybody um, is familiar with the Peace Boat or peaceboat.org. Okay, everybody should check it out for real because it's one of the things, it's, it's phenomenal. It's been around for quite some time. And it is uh, an organization that, you know, in terms of the digital, okay, let me think how to put this. The digital era is, quite young, there's still a lot to be designed and there's a lot of convening that will happen just because of the fact that we're designing this thing as we go, like one does with peace. And what the Peace Boat does, it carries various projects and campaigns to promote peace, human rights and sustainability, working with partner organizations and individuals in Japan, Northeast Asia and around the world. It uses local grassroots actions, international conferences, global networking, et cetera. Okay, but it's an actual giant boat that goes around the world building friendships for peace. And I think we could do the same, I mean, if there's somebody that could fund it, obviously, to convene people on a mass, I mean, when you look at peaceboat.org and imagine it, 
it's it's something that we could get the word out. We could use to get the word out because we're in a new stage and this is a design comment and idea. And my last question is, or my only question is, a lot of times I think in the conferences we get so general and I think that we're all, when we convene, we know that we need to do this, we need to do that. I'm super curious about um, one of the things that you've done at IGF that you're most proud of that you've seen have a big impact because I know it's there and constantly hearing generalizations about what we should do and could do is I think um, less the point and more let's get psyched about what we are doing. But um, yeah, thank you very much for giving me time on the mic. Thank you. And I'm gonna ask everybody here to remember the questions so that we, when we unwind uh, after the, the last two speakers, we'll be able to answer any of the questions that are pending. I think I'll go to that mic first because I think I saw you there first and then we'll go to Bertrand and then I'll read two statements that I've received, please. Oh, and there's a person there. I'm sorry. One, two, three. Okay. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll try and Please. be brief to make space for everybody. My name's Emma Gibson. I'm with the Alliance for Universal Digital Rights, or Audrey for short. And we were a, part of a number of organizations who launched these 10 feminist principles for including gender in the global digital compact. We did that on Saturday. And one of the principles is around um, increasing the leadership of women in um, internet governance and policy making. So it was great to hear one of the contributors talking about the, the makeup of the panel and the success there. Um, so really my question is around how important do you think the issue of gender is in, um, in internet and digital governance? Thank you. Add it to your question. Bertrand, can I ask you a favor? I was just told that he had been waiting there forever and it was my yeah, absence. Yeah. So please, that, that's what thank I you. Th please. That's what I thought, actually. Okay, thank you very much. Please. Thank you, Chair. I'll try to be brief. I'm, uh, I'm one of the authors of the Geneva Principles, that is to say, one of the state's representatives in Geneva in two, December 2003, uh, one of the many authors, so I have a stake in that. Uh, I'd just like to appeal for some recognition of the principles. The whole process has principles. They were developed 20 years ago, and nobody in this uh, forum has actually mentioned principles. We've mentioned uh, frameworks, we've mentioned action lines, uh, many other processes, but it might be a good thing to go back and review the principles and just tick off what's been done against those principles because they took a lot of discussion. You would not believe how much discussion it took to actually agree on what are fairly simple principles. It took us a week to develop principles. and. One, another comment that uh, has been made this afternoon is that we need um, uh, we need to bring in we need to have some sort of uh, attention to the legal basis or maybe the intellectual basis of this work we're doing. Well, for a legal basis, there was also back in Geneva in December 2003 a huge amount of debate on the preamble for those principles and. There was a strong opposition at the summit to including references to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We managed by open debate, strong debate, to overcome that opposition, and we have now, we included the UDHR in the preamble of the Geneva Principles. That is the basis of a fairly good approach to, uh, you know, legal consideration of the basis for uh, the internet. So take it back a few steps and review that document. It's, it's, it's like tablets of stone. It's the beginning, okay? That's just a suggestion. No, thank, thank you. you very much. And before you wander off, please, because I can't even really see you uh, because of the light in my eyes, could you please introduce yourself? I'm sorry. Winston Roberts, uh, I was way back 20 years ago, a uh, representative of New Zealand at the WISIS in Geneva. Not now, uh, pri now uh, working for an NGO, IFLA, representing the global library sector. I love IFLA. That is access to information. 
Thank you also very much. Also, action line. I'll stop now. Thanks. No, I think it's great, and, and, and I did read it once for the classroom, but I think going back to it is great. Thank you for the suggestion. Bertrand, please. Good afternoon. My name is Bertrand de La Chapelle. I'm the executive director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network and the uh, chief vision officer of the Data Sphere Initiative. Few points. The first thing is I love the title of this panel because it's the future of Internet governance, and we need to make sure that it contains both the future of the IGF, but it's only a portion of the discussion of the future of Internet governance. And when we talk about internet governance, sorry to repeat myself, there's this distinction between governance of and governance on the internet. And the governance of the internet as a whole range, an ecosystem of organizations, they're not perfect, but as has been said before, it is what kept us together as an infrastructure during the period of the pandemic. The governance on the internet, however, is a scattered piece of institutions that are working in silos, mostly intergovernmental, but also individual initiatives. And at the moment, it is what uh, Laura Denardis has described as an inchoate system. It's just an embryonic thing. So when we talk about the future of internet governance, I think there is a third layer, which is we're talking actually about the governance, uh, internet and the governance in the digital age. And governance in the digital age, and going back to what uh, Jordan was saying, the key question that is in front of us is what is the digital society we want to build? And I like, although I don't always agree with Anita, I agree that there are fundamental questions that are political questions regarding what is the internet and the digital society or the information society we want to build. And that's what is in front of us. A more concrete thing to pick on what Jordan was saying, but in the reverse order. The resources for the IGF is a competition in hypocrisy. It is unacceptable that anybody complains, particularly among governments, about what the IGF doesn't produce when the contributions are barely supporting a staff that is half the size of my own organization. This is unacceptable. That being said, this is one of the reasons why you cannot do more with what we have, and the IGF is just one of the building blocks that we need to build upon. Which brings to the second point that he mentioned, which is the notion of coordination. And Timea was mentioning very rightly that the goal is not to make the ITF deal with everything at all levels. We have the dynamic coalitions. They are a first step towards what could be called issue-based networks that can be catalyzed in the environment of the IGF, where on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, the relevant stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder fashion get together to address an issue and report every year on what they're doing within the IGF on top of the dynamic coalition so that it's operational. Finally, on the question of ambition, I said already that this is about the digital society we want to build. I like the reference and there is a bunch of us in here who were there at the WISIS. And the question of what is the digital society we want to build is actually a recognition that every single evolution of the Communication in humanity, be it language, be it writing, or be it the printing press, has changed dramatically the way societies organize. And history is basically the effort of mankind to organize in larger and more and more interconnected communities. We have the challenge of organizing the coexistence of 7 billion people, 5 billion or 7 billion people uh, connected online. And I want to finish by quoting this expression that has been attributed to Kofi Annan. I don't know whether it is really him who said it, but at least he is referenced as having said that. In designing the governance for the internet or the internet age, we need to be as innovative as the people who invented it. We invented this new thing with the IGF, and I carry here the bag from the first IGF in 2006, which shows that it is sustainable, by the way. <laughs> but I think the challenge is, what is the governance architecture that we need in the digital age? And this is why the title of this panel is a good one. Thank you. Uh, sir, I had already closed the queue, I think, before you came up. So the queue was already closed, so I'm sorry. 
I'm going to read two that were submitted online, and then I'm going to go back to the panel. So for, please forgive me, but the queue had been closed. Yeah, so. Can I make a very short one? A very short one? Yeah. But I had already closed the queue, and I already chased two people away from the other line. There is always the exception. No. Um, we also have this one. My question, what is the position of leadership panel on the nature of existing internet? Internet is a peaceful development oriented and civilian environment or internet as new battlefield for cyber warfare and as a weaponized tool against other nations. Do we need a global declaration to recognize internet as a peaceful and civilian only environment? What would be the contribution of the IGF in this regard? That was a question from Amir Mokaberi. Hopefully I pronounced the name somewhat close. And this comment from Segun Ulag Ulubile. Again, forgive me. It is time to move from the IGF chambers discussion into action. Considering global efforts of the UN Digital Compact, IGF should start evolving into Internet and Digital Governance Forum. Many stakeholders speak to digital governance far more in contrast to Internet governance. There can be no Internet without the digital, but there can be digital without the Internet. Time to converge these two most important critical elements of our modern life. People now interact through a digital sharing system without necessarily being on the internet. The ecosystem needs to be proactive and creative as well as to transform the global internet and digital ecosystems into a unified space for peace, innovation, and development. So I've read those two. Now what I'd like to do is sort of unwind the panel, but basically from, from one edge to the other try and keep it to like two minutes, given that we haven't much time and we did speak extensively at the beginning. And see if you can catch some of the questions, please. Thank you. Thanks, Avri. Um, I'll try, and we're like, we have quite a few questions. Um, but I think I want to speak to, to maybe, maybe three of them. Um, one is, what can we do to really to address the gaps that we've been talking about? Um, I think in, in this evolving nature of internet governance, digital governance, is the IGF equipped to do digital governance, et cetera. It already sort of does, if, in, in my personal opinion. Uh, it has evolved from discussing purely internet governance in the beginning to basically anything and everything that concerns digital. And that's, that's fine, that's okay. It's it evolved organically. Um, it is a bit crowded. So sometimes it, it is a good friend of mine sometimes says it's like drinking from a fire hose. So, so we need to focus, right? We can discuss everything, but we cannot discuss everything at the same time. Look at how the SDGs are discussed at the global community, for example. We have 17 of them. We pick one or two each year, get together, high level political forum. Um, uh, we, we discuss progress, how it went, go away, take two others next year. We cannot do everything at the same time. And that needs to be, I think, recognized, one. Two, how important is gender? Extremely. The one thing, I think it was Doreen on one of the panels earlier this week, she said, as the digital divides are shrinking in certain areas, as connectivity is shrinking, uh, connectivity divide is shrinking, the gender divide is persistent. So as we get more people online, but as we get more people online, the gender divide remains the same between them. So gender is a critical issue, but it's not an issue on its own. It's an issue in everything we do, and we need to have the gender glasses on. We need to mainstream gender into conversations. It's not something that you have to have a, a gender session at a conference, or you have to have a, um, a gender track at the IGF. It needs to be in everything we do organically. And then third, what have we done that is a success? We've done this. First of all, we've gone very far with the multi-stakeholder model. We still have an IGF that convenes thousands of people every year. But we have dynamic coalitions, as Bertrand said. We have best practice form. We produce outputs. What we haven't done is talk about them so that other people know. So I think we, <laughs> I really don't want to forget that. Thank you. Anita, please, two minutes or there. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of points. I do think that the uh, co-proposition that the technical is also political is very important. So I do agree that um, 
any internationalism of the internet would also require a certain idea that it belongs to, uh, uh, it is a common heritage of humankind that is backed legitimately by some kind of public law. Um, to address Bertrand, I'm very happy that we were able to meet more than halfway on something. The problem, I think, sometimes with a forum like the IGF is there is a lot of confirmation bias. I don't really have to lecture people who research and advocate around the internet on what confirmation bias means, what a filter bubble means. So if only you spoke to many like me, maybe there would be many more people who disagree with many people here at the IGF. That's because there are people we work with on digital sequence information and synthetic biology, where natural resources management is today in huge conflict with data about natural resources that is getting stolen. Trade and data flows where you really don't know what to do when public data sets are taken away by, you know, from your governments by transnational digital companies. We work with indigenous people whose traditional knowledge and data ownership are two sides of the same coin. And these are the majority world. They are 80% of the world. So in some ways, they're not present here at the IGF. And I really think that at the WHO, we are fighting about data rights in terms of contributions. The COVID pandemic has been mentioned. Pathogen data is being given by countries from Africa into the, the corpus of the WHO, but the benefits occurring from pharmacological research from that data set is not going back to Africa. It's going into the patent system controlled by a few corporations. So I think that we really need to think about one thing. Is there a, a real separation between governance on the internet and governance of digital society? No, because all existence is hybrid. And all our reality is hybrid. We are homo technicus, and I will leave that thought with you because I do agree with Renata that it's a futile argument to look at this except as two sides of the same coin. Thank you. Thank you. Renata, please. Thank you, Avril. Uh, I would like to comment the aspect of gender. And um, I think it's not enough to simply increase, it's important, of course, and I'm glad to be here with one, two, three, four, five, six marvelous women in this panel. But uh, I want to put something. It's not enough to simply increase the diversity of participation. The diversity needs to be reflecting decision-making spaces. My presence here today also reflects the long-term transformations driving by multi-stakeholder discussions, not only within CGI, but also in the Brazilian community as a whole. I, I'm only here because I'm the first female coordinator of the Internet Steering Committee in Brazil since its creation in 1995. Um, another comment, uh, briefly, is about uh, the challenges we are facing here, about the future of internet, the future of governance, the internet and the digital, and uh, the, the main uh, uh, principle of this age effort, what, it, what internet do you want? And I think, oh my God, what world do you want to, to build? In the, uh, in, for the future, for our kids, for our children. And I think maybe uh, we have uh, the, we agreed with the problems, with the diagnosis, and maybe we need to profound the solutions to face these problems we have today uh, involving the governance in our community. And that's why, and I'm going to put this as a commentary, um, that's why uh, I think we have to deepen the debate about the gaps we have to fulfill to the IGF. And to address this discussion, as uh, much of you have heard, CGI has recently decided uh, to advance the dialogues and informal consultations with various stakeholders to go the ecosystem to the opportunity, feasibility, and adherence to a possible event in Brazil in 2024 
to discuss and produce a multi-stakeholder consensus on these stems we are discussing there, just to put this to, to everybody think about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lisa, please. Thank you. Um, we've discussed many crucial aspects of the future of internet governance here today, and uh, I've heard the principles uh, that actually uh, we build on are extremely important. I hear transparency of the choices taken by uh, IGFs is important, and I agree. Uh, and also the substance of, of what we discuss uh, is, uh, of course, important. But we need to be open and inclusive. Um, the challenges, again, have all the relevant parties involved. This means all genders to me, and I think gender is still an important one. But we also uh, hear uh, about different nationalities and people needs to be involved, and I, I completely agree. Funding of the Secretariat, yes, it is a very small Secretariat. We need to have stronger funding for the Secretariat because their task has uh, grown bigger and uh, there it's extremely important. Um, uh, Jordan talked about Im ambition, ambition and I think ambition is, is a key for us. We need to have an ambition to develop and evolve uh, IGF. But again, uh, there is a strong support and, and also in the leadership panel for human-centric internet, the multi-stakeholder model needs to remain. Uh, so one last thing is we need to raise the profile of IGF. We need to set the agenda, getting new uh, participation uh, on shaping the internet for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan, please. Uh, three quick thoughts. I'm not going to try and tackle specific questions. The first is, if this stuff is so important, we need to resource it properly. You know, there are as many people in my policy and stakeholder engagement team as there are in the IGF secretariat. Similar story to Beton. Uh, the people with the checkbooks and the biggest checkbooks are the governments. I think we need to take another look at this digital governance question and uh, change the balance. The second thing is, the, the profound political and governance issues that have been tabled in this, in this panel themselves could have used a lot more expansion and uh, contest here because we had an interesting discussion. I'm fascinated by some of what I've heard. And I'm going to rush off to another session and it's the second to last day and we go. So I wonder whether we're actually paying enough attention to internet governance at the internet governance forum. Uh, and that is a challenge that, that comes here because, you know, there are sexy issues. There's the importance of AI. There are a hundred different topics on the agenda. And then we don't get into the real foundations of the model that we're sort of just swimming in. So I think that's an observation that I offer. Um, the third, I guess, is the reminder to look back at the principles that have come before because you don't always have to reinvent or invent new things. Sometimes there are foundations that are out there that can be the base of what we need to do. So just some reflections back. Thank you, and I really like what's been said. I really very much enjoy the symphony of provocative voices, and I, like you, wish we had been spent all day on this kind of discussion going through it, and with that, I give you the last word. Yes, so, so we are about to finish, but I, I'd like to emphasize as co-moderator something that was uh, being said here. So I think that all the interventions from our speakers and from the audience, both here and uh, online, they were very rich, very productive, and uh, they will enlighten us as for the future. And this future, <laughs> so the session is called um, the future of the digital governance. It is uh, something that uh, uh, um, we reflect together on what we were talking about. And Bertrand said again something that is being telling for uh, several years. We are talking about uh, two different things. It's uh, governance of the internet and governance on the internet. And I think that with that, I think that we um, understand much better what we are talking about. It's about the future of the internet in the digital age nowadays, as it was in the information society age in the 19s, and then in the knowledge-based economies in the 20s, in the cyber in the, in the 10s, 
and now uh, uh, we are talking about digital. But in two years, we will, we will, we will be talking about something else. But one thing that will be always here is the internet. So we are here for the internet and to make it a weapon for peace, something for us as a good thing for the humankind. Thank you very much. A big applause to our speakers. <laughs>